Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We're super excited to tell you the story of Natural Stone Institute and Polycore's journeys to create industry-wide and product-specific EPDs. I'm Terry Swack, and I'm the CEO and founder of Sustainable Minds, and it's my pleasure to moderate our webinar series, Transparency is the New Green. Once again, we're able to host a fantastic industry association or trade association uh, who has taken the lead on developing environmental performance and material health disclosures for the industry and have really done a phenomenal job of figuring out how to report a fairly complex supply chain, engage its members, and ultimately tell a, a very compelling story. So today's agenda, um, I'm going to introduce Sustainable Minds. I will also introduce uh, Sarah and Jasmine uh, from NSI and Polycore. At the beginning, I'll tell you a little bit about the benefits that we provide for trade associations to, to work with us. I'm going to introduce you to our brand of EPD. We call them transparency reports. Uh, ISO 14025 says a program operator can call their type three environmental declarations anything they want. EPD is a colloquialism. It's not even the technical term. We call, so we call ours transparency reports because there's a lot more content in them uh, than you would find in a typical uh, technical report. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we've designed the catalog, the transparency catalog to uh, help people find higher performing, low embodied carbon, healthier products and make comparisons and be able to export those products uh, into your own internal digital libraries. I'm gonna to touch on the relationship with the embodied carbon construction calculator because that's kind of a core to our uh, embodied carbon story. And then we'll go right into Sarah telling uh, about Natural Stone Institute's journey, followed by Jasmine talking about all the incredible work they're doing at Polycore. Now, this webinar is being recorded. You will get a link to the recording probably the next day uh, after the webinar is over. If you would like a copy of the deck, you can request it on your way out. There is a short uh, survey as you exit just to gauge uh, some interest. Um, in this webinar, so if you'd be so kind as to leave your thoughts, you'll also be able to leave any other questions or, or comments that you have as you leave. We will be responding online to some questions as they come in, if we're able to do that. And if we do have time at the end, we'll take some questions. Uh, I can't guarantee that's gonna happen, um, but we'll see. All right, so uh, for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar with Sustainable Minds, have not attended one of our webinars or worked with us before. Uh, Sustainable Minds is the only end-to-end -end product transparency solution provider in the market today. We are a program operator. We work with industry organizations to develop product category rules. Uh, Sarah's going to mention we work to do one so they could complete uh, their EPDs. We publish uh, EPDs, again, we call ours transparency reports. We deliver life cycle assessment, material ingredient disclosure services and carbon accounting. Um, and all of the technical disclosure work is really in service to helping product manufacturers integrate product transparency into product marketing so that those products get selected and actually added to products. So it's really, some people may not like me to say this, but EPDs are marketing tools. And we've built the Transparency Catalog, which is a platform specifically to help manufacturers investing in product transparency, get their brands and their products, the transparency information in front of the most highly motivated and targeted users looking specifically for brands and their products with transparency information. So I also like to set this, uh, this context as we talk about transparency. Product transparency is really all about performance. 
environmental performance and material health are performance criteria that are now used in both the manufacture of products and in the selection of products. And for that, uh, for that purpose, the primary reason for manufacturers to do life cycle assessments and material assessments is for them to gain insights into their own product life cycle and their own material ingredients to understand where there are impacts and risks to human health so that they can actually go ahead and make higher performing, healthier products. There's no requirement for them to report publicly. Then and only then they can choose to, yeah, I'm gonna take these technical reports and I'm gonna use them to create public facing documentations, documentation. And so as the industry has evolved and more manufacturers have produced uh, transparency documentation, it isn't just enough to have the documentation anymore. People actually don't just check the box, yes, there's an EPD. People really care about performance and they're looking for actually higher performing products. So really being able to understand what the technical disclosures are telling you uh, matters and the ability to make comparative decision actually matter. But a lot of times, you know, even though the information is technical and there's explanations, what it kind of comes down to is people make decisions about the brands they want to do business with based on their feeling and belief about that brand. And so what we do is when we work with the manufacturers, we think it's really important that the manufacturers don't just report, but that they're able to actually explain what they're doing to improve the environmental performance and material health of their products so that you can understand, I get it, these guys know what they're doing, this makes sense, and the disclosure, the technical disclosure, is simply the documentation to show the credible evidence that their efforts are making a difference. So when we started the transparency catalog in, in 2016, we, we kind of, did it on a, a hunch, hoping that enough manufacturers would create transparency documentation. And as the only program operator in North America who really cares, has cared about aggregate, aggregating all EPDs in one place, um, we've been, our, our hunch essentially has paid off in that, you know, the creation of EPDs has really caught on and people are using it uh, in all, all different uh, geographies, types of institutions, uh, and to really make comparative decisions. And so we are very committed to making the information, you know, no longer just easy to find, but easy to use by helping to make it actionable. So we established this relationship with the EC3 tool uh, back when they were in alpha, back in, in 2019. And uh, when we looked at their methodology of how they were aggregating the embodied carbon results from EPDs uh, in each product category, it was you know, pretty, pretty complicated and also is a very new kind of, of methodology. And so you know, essentially said, all people want to know is, is something better or worse than something else? And where does it fall compared to kind of the, the general industry range? And so in the EC3 methodology, this is what they do. They actually take all the EPDs, they plot the embodied carbon uh, results reported in each EPD, they establish an industry range, and then they take the embodied carbon result from each specific EPD and compare it to that industry range. And so we worked with them to develop essentially this quintile way of reporting that industry range and being able to say you know in the lowest 20th percentile is really the best is where you want to be the lowest achievable uh, embodied carbon impacts and the 80th percentile uh, generally means that the data is so non-specific in the EPD it can't actually be uh, certain about about the results. 
And so that word certain is very important in the rest of this discussion because this methodology involves what they call the burden of the doubt. Uh, it involves applying an uncertainty penalty where if the data is not specific to the product, the manufacturer, the supply chain, then the results are more uncertain because they're not specific. They're general or they're made from public data, whatever it is. And so the EC3 tool methodology applies this uncertainty calculation and then compares the results from the highest level of uncertainty from the EPD to the industry range, which includes all of the uncertainty values from all of the EPDs. So because an industry-wide EPD is not specific, right, by definition, it's multiple manufacturers, multiple plants, you're never going to see, not never, sorry, you are rarely going to see an industry-wide EPD where the embodied carbon impacts are in the lowest 20th percentile because it's so nonspecific. Now, we've already done an industry-wide EPD where the results were in the 20th percentile, and that was for cellulose insulation. And uh, there's just no argument that cellulose insulation just doesn't have a lot of impact. Um, so most industry-wide EPDs show up in the 40th to 60th percentile. And the way you're going to uh, hear Sarah and Jasmine talk about they gave a lot of thought in the way that they created the industry-wide EPD so that it would be possible and simpler for the participants in each industry-wide EPD to create product-specific versions and be able to show how they uh, have optimized or improved or the way they make that product actually does have lower embodied carbon impacts than what's reported in the industry-wide EPD. And Jasmine's going to talk about that and how they were able to do that with several, not all, but several of their product-specific EPDs. And because people just want to be able to find, you know, the lowest embodied carbon or a range of 20th or 40th, so in the transparency catalog, because we have all of the data and it just displays as one of the uh, information attributes of an EPD, we've added a filter where you can go into the transparency catalog, you can pick a master format section, you don't have to, you can use this filter before you select any other filter, you can use it in any order, but literally in a single click, you can just show only the products with EPDs that uh, fit the uh, threshold uh, that you want to design, uh, design for to include. So, NSI created three industry-wide transparency reports, one for stone, stone flooring and paving, one for exterior dimension stone cladding, and one for countertops. And you'll see that the transparency catalog uh, it was actually the very first digital EPD. We started publishing these in 2013. Uh, we have developed a template to make it a standardized way Every transparency report uses this template, but because uh, we use images and branding from each uh, participant, each entity, uh, they take on their own uh, look and feel. Um, you can see in this industry-wide EPD, all of the participating manufacturers are listed right here. And there's a little bit of a different mix in each one of these, uh, but everyone who participated is, is right here. And again, because this is digital and you'll see how it connects to the transparency catalog, we add a listing in the transparency catalog for every single participant because each participant now can use the industry-wide EPD for their products. And we want to make it easy for every architect, engineer, contractor, and owner to be able to find every manufacturer investing in product transparency for products available in North America uh, in the transparency catalog. Um, the, trans the transparency report, again, because it's web pages, is designed in three pages. So the front page is all of the information you'd want uh, to understand the functional and environmental attributes of the product. 
The second page contains all of the technical information required by the PCR to be in an EPD, along with explanation about what are the greatest impacts occurring? Where is that happening? What's the manufacturer doing to improve? And Sarah and uh, Jasmine are gonna show you some sections of, of their transparency reports. And page three is literally only dedicated to letting the manufacturer talk about what they're doing to improve the environmental performance in every life cycle stage. So it actually comes back and, and uh, illustrates what the technical information is being reported here. Here's what's actually happening uh, in, in the real world. So now you can see Polycor after participating in the industry-wide EPD, we already had their data. Um, we were able to go ahead and uh, work with them to create these product-specific EPDs. They've created eight, two of which are optimized. And again, Jasmine's going to tell you more about that. But the result is, in the transparency catalog, this industry-wide EPD, the results show that the impacts of exterior dimension stone cladding uh, is in the 60th percentile of all materials in that category. And polycores, limestone facades, cladding, and walls shows that it's, it, that it's in the 20th percentile of lowest embodied carbon materials in that same catalog in that same category and you can come to the transparency catalog and go to each of their listings you can see again on the industry association listing there's a link to all of the participants who participated in their industry-wide EPDs with links to the listings of the participants and uh, it's one way to get to the polycore listing and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Sarah to tell your story. All right. Thank you so much, Terry, for that introduction. My name is Sarah Gregg. Very happy to be here today. I've been in the natural stone industry for 20 years now. I started out working in sales and marketing for a very small granite countertop fabricator. And kind of my career evolved over the years. About seven years in, I decided to start freelancing. So I went off on my own and I was working for uh, several companies and associations in the natural stone industry, which has given me a really unique perspective or set of perspectives rather, since I've looked at the industry from so many different lenses, um, couriers, fabricators, distributors, associations, all of the above. So it's proven to be very valuable to my work. In January of 2020, I made the leap to become a full-time employee at the Natural Stone Institute. Prior to that, I'd been contracting with them for several years, but I wanted to be able to focus more of my time on the sustainability piece. Um, this gave me the opportunity to do more research, developing tools, teaching stone professionals and the design teams in the market about all of the sustainable attributes of natural stone. So I'm really excited to be here today just to share our experience in developing these industry-wide EPDs for natural stone. A little more about the Natural Stone Institute. Oops, I clicked too fast there. We have over 2,000 members in over 50 countries, so we are a global trade association and we represent the entire dimension stone industry from raw material extraction at the quarries to fabrication and installation companies and through care and maintenance and renovation phases. And then also all of the tools and machinery suppliers that support our industry. We are the authoritative source for standards in our industry. We provide timely and relevant information and education throughout the building industry and ensure that the voices, voices of our members are heard. So the EPD project that we'll talk about today is a prime example of our association's responsibility, which is rallying multiple sectors of the industry, research and development of transparency documentation, and then analyzing and pushing out those results to stone professionals and also members of the design community, helping to elevate preference and ensure proper use of natural stone materials. In 2014, under the Natural Stone Council, our industry developed the Natural Stone Sustainability Standard. 
and the intent was to develop metrics for sustainable production of natural dimension stone across a variety of categories. And you see a, a summary of those categories on the screen, but they cover environmental, ecological, human health, and also social accountability. And since we originally published, it's been updated four times. We're working on a fifth update this year, but just proving to you that our commitment to this standard to ensuring its relevance in this ever evolving green building market uh, is really a commitment of ours and, and we stand behind it. We've had trouble though, building awareness about this standard, which is why one of the prime reasons why we decided to move forward with the development of EPDs and HPDs in our industry. So why we developed our industry-wide EPDs and HPDs. We noticed that other materials that we competed against in several product categories had this data. We're using that data to position themselves as a green building product. We didn't have the data. Um, we had the story. We felt that our results would be fav favorable. And we just wanted to make sure that we weren't missing anything with regard to industry resources. And so we also wanted to kind of support that claim that we were a natural single ingredient building material that em emits no VOCs. Again, these are stories that we've been telling, you know, maybe mostly to ourselves, but we're trying to get across to the design community and specifiers and consumers. And once we have the quantifiable data that's, in, that's available with the EPDs and HPDs, we just felt that that story would resonate a bit more. And I believe that it has. Oh, I missed one here. There was also new policies and regulations that we were paying attention to that told us that one day this global warming potential data was going to be required in order to, to be involved in certain building projects. So we wanted to position the industry to thrive. That was another big reason why, why we went ahead when we did. And then again, our industry standard just wasn't gaining the traction that we had hoped it would. After all of the time and effort and money that we put into the standard, we just weren't seeing the, the results. And so we were hoping that these EPDs and HPDs would help to pull that standard along as far as awareness goes. And so we went forward and published three industry-wide EPDs, one for cladding, one for stone flooring and paving, and one for stone countertops. And we also published a set of 13 industry-wide HPDs. And these were very simple product for our single ingredient material. The HPDC has a special exception for geological materials, so it made it quite easy for us to produce these. And it's provided us an in, which we didn't realize originally, to be in, included in some of these catalogs of eco-friendly building materials. Just having that transparency documentation got us in where just asking them, you know, hey, we're a natural product, will you put us in your in your catalog wasn't quite working. So we just needed a little bit more of this um, official data to get us moving. And it's been very, very helpful for us. But it wasn't an easy task. Um, there was a lot of parts to the whole process, starting with some key decisions that we had to make before we could even talk about it within our industry, then building awareness within our industry. You now I find that there's a lot of landscape architects, interior designers, even architects who aren't really familiar with embodied carbon and aren't really sure you know, how it's calculated and how to make comparisons. So for our industry, you know, we had even more awareness building and, and teaching to do before we could move forward. We also had to figure out how to fund this as an industry-wide document. We wanted to be able to supplement the cost of it, but we just weren't able to cover it all. So I'll talk about what we, our strategies for getting this paid for. The data collection, several pieces and parts there, which I'll explain. Then the review and publishing phase. And then finally, once they were finished and published, you know, what does this data mean? We need to figure out how to use this to tell a better story and promote it to the industry and to the design community. So first up, we have our key decisions. Before we could do 
sorry, these slides are getting away from me here. Before we could do anything, there was a lot of things that we needed just to understand. When I first got started, I sent out an RFP to a few EPD program operators, and I got back more questions than I got answers. Um, they wanted to know what the functional unit was going to be that we wanted to use, what the scope was, what was the product application, how many companies were going to participate, where were these companies located. So a lot of questions that we had to, to answer, have many meetings about to figure out the answers to. And ultimately, the answers to most of the questions were all defined within the PCR. So the PCR, or product category rule, is what sort of defines what's going to go into the EPD, right? So for natural stone, what we chose for applications was cladding, flooring, and countertops. And the reason we chose those three particular applications among a sea of different product applications that natural stone is, is good use, well used for, um, these were the ones that we saw the most demand for this type of product transparency for. There were more um, of our competing building materials that had EPDs in these categories than in the other one. So those, that's why we started there. We also chose PCRs that were to a functional unit of a square meter. There was a lot of them out there that we found that were written uh, with the functional unit of one ton, but we felt to properly represent the environmental impacts of bringing our materials to market, the, the square meter option was better. And we also had to decide on which parts of the scope, and I've got a slide about that here, so I'm not gonna to talk too much about that, just that we decided to do the full scope from raw material extraction through end of, end of life um, instead of just the first piece of it. Another thing with the PCR is there were three great PCRs that were available that we could use with one exception, the flooring PCR, had everything we needed except it actually explicitly excluded natural stone from the PCR. So we had to create a part B which basically used the exact same definitions of the original flooring PCR and then allowed natural stone to be included there. So that was another part of it, um, all things that need to be developed and worked through. Uh, since we've published, I've actually been approached about two of our PCRs that are expiring either soon or very recently. And now we need to talk to other industries and make sure that these PCRs stay up to date. So it's kind of an ever, um, so it's a project that will never go away. We got to keep those PCRs up to date and make sure that their relevance in the market is, is strong. In regards to the scope, this is a screenshot from one of our transparency reports. And I think it does a good job of showcasing the scope part. So a lot of the EPDs that we found, both for natural stone that had already been published and for other materials, were covering only the A1 to A3. So the quarrying, the transporting to the production facility, and then the processing of that raw material into usable building units. It wasn't in a lot of them weren't including the rest of it, but we felt like stone had a really good story to tell because our product is very durable. There's not a lot of repair and replacement that is required at the end of its life. There's a lot of options for recycling and reuse. So we wanted to make sure that we were telling as much of the story as we could with these EPDs. And I also want to take um, talk a little bit about on this slide is another one of the key decisions that we had to make is who to use for a program operator. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, we had approached a few different companies to help us with this. And ultimately we settled on Sustainable Minds as our partner here. And I've never regretted that decision. They've been wonderful to work with. At first, the reason that we chose them was because we felt that their ability to help us build awareness of the EPDs after they were published was better than any other provider. And just being on this webinar today, I think proves that they're following up with um, great results there by just putting us in positions to tell our story and to build awareness about our natural stone EPDs. 
but also throughout the process of data collection and developing the PCR in the early phases. You know, they've just been a really great partner and I just want to give them props for that. So thank you to, to the whole team. The next phase, I guess, of the process of developing these industry-wide EPDs was building awareness and recruiting companies to participate. We did a lot of webinars. We did a lot of one-on-one -on -one phone calls. We had meetings at industry events, just all trying to explain to our industry what these EPDs could do for our industry, why we needed them to participate, what participation looked like. You know, they're going to have to collect data, but where are they going to get this data? And how are they going to submit it? How much time is it going to take? Oh, and how much money is it going to take? But a lot of a lot of work went into this. It probably took us about six months um, in this part of the phase, just getting the word out and getting companies to commit to participating. Ultimately, we ended up with 16 couriers. So they're the raw material extractors, right? We had 11 producers. So they're taking those raw blocks of stone and turning them into usable building units. And then we had six countertop fabricators, which the countertop fabricators only submitted data for the countertop EPD. The other two EPDs, their piece wasn't um, included in those, it wasn't needed to produce those building materials. But I just want to thank the companies that participated because they've shown a lot of leadership, a lot of um, foresight into the future, understanding the need for these documents and being willing to step up and and participate. So I just want to take that time to thank them. As far as funding goes, the total project costs us $90,000. Half of this was, was got by a grant from the Natural Stone Foundation, which we are extremely lucky to have in our industry. They do a phenomenal job of fundraising and identifying key initiatives that will impact our industry in a positive way. So we approached them about helping to fund part of this project and they gave us half of the money that we needed. The other half we asked for co contributions from the companies that were participating. So not only were they taking the time and effort to collect this data and submit this data, they also contributed some money to the effort as well. So I, I know there's some industry associations that are likely listening to this. So I think it's important just to kind of share our experience there with how it is funded, because as a nonprofit, it's not always easy for us to do the good work that we know needs to be done because everything costs money. And it's hard sometimes to show an ROI to individual companies because what they're doing is helping the whole industry. It's not just helping their company. So again, that, that leadership in the particip participants is really key. Um, data collection and review. So this phase took about a year. First, we had to determine which data sets were needed in, uh, in order to properly define the environmental impacts of manufacturing natural stone. So these impacts include fuels, electricity, water, uh, blades, packaging materials, a lot of different things um, for any industry, but those are some of our hot button items for natural stone. We then needed to provide guidance for companies participated. Where do you find this data and how do you make any necessary conversions? For example, you know, we use blades to cut the stone. How much do the blades weigh? <laughs> and how do you get those big things on a scale? Some of these blades are 10 foot in diameter and I don't even know how much they weigh, but it's, it's a lot. Um, another example you can see on your invoice that you paid X amount of dollars for water to the utility company, but how many gallons did you use? Everything needed to be converted. So some companies took longer to organize and submit this data than others. Once it was all submitted, our LCA team looked through the data, identified any outliers, uh, for example, if a company's results were significantly lower in one part than others, um, they contacted them just to figure out what were they missing. Or maybe another company's results were significantly higher in a particular portion of the data. Did they include data that was outside of our intended scope? And then finally, 
once we got all that part sorted through, we went got into the third party review, which took place to ensure that the final results were compliant with the PCRs. Um, just want to take a minute to give a shout out to Jack Guy Big at Echo Forum who performed this review for us. He knows our industry very well, and I was very happy with his feedback. Um, asked some really good questions, which resulted, I think, in an, an improvement to our final product. So big thank you to him. So the next step was to analyze the results and promote it. You know, this the the part that I've talked about so far is so many steps, right? And then you think once they publish, you're done, but that's not the case. <laughs> we then needed to figure out a way to tell this story, you know, that we'd been telling for a while and wanted to make sure that we had um, as close to an apples to apples comparison as possible. So I'm running out of time here. I'm just gonna try not to rush over too many important parts here. But the functional unit um, and the scope are two things that you think are clearly defined in a PCR, but there's a lot of variables that you might not think about. And that includes the material thickness and the finish. Those, those um, factors affect the, the environmental impact. And when you're comparing across materials, then it's not always, it's not always clear. In regard to the scope, um, what was the installation method used? There's so many different ones, but what one did they use to calculate this, this data? Also the span of the life cycle, are they including all of the parts of the phase or is it just the cradle to gate? Also maintenance assumptions, transportation distances, a lot of different pieces to consider there. So what we've what we've kind of figured out with the with our EPDs is, and I'm going to show you now how we're kind of presenting this. And this is just one example. We've done a similar comparison to several other materials as well. But for natural stone, when we bring this material to market, this is what we're doing. We're quarrying it from the ground. We're transporting that material to the producer. Usually that's within a few miles of the quarry. At the producer, that raw material is cut into units. The surface is polished or edges finished. Depending on the different application, there's different types of finishing that are required, right? So for cladding, what we ended up with for our industry-wide report was 21.4 kilograms of CO2 equivalent or embodied carbon, and that's um, in the A1 to A3 portion of the life cycle. For flooring, we were at 22 kilograms, and for countertops a little higher because there's a third facility required to complete that material, we were at 46.8 kilograms. Now let's look at precast concrete and particularly cladding. So they start off at the same place that we begin, where their minerals are mined. So they're taking stone from the ground, just like we are. They're transporting it to first the cement manufacturer, which is a pretty high impact manufacturing process. Lots of heat, um, fair amount of time to turn these minerals into a powder. The steel is then acquired, um, transported to the steel manufacturer, melted into rods so that it can be incorporated into those cladding panels. Then there's another step of mining the aggregates. Um, there's the cement first, but then there's also additional aggregates that go into the mix later on. All of these different ingredients, the aggregates, the cement, the steel, they are also include fly ash in a lot of precast concrete mixtures these days to try to reduce some of the environmental impacts, which is great. And then other additives, you know, dyes, fibers, et cetera, all transported to the manufacturing plant where they are combined with water, placed into molds and cured. And at that point, it's a usable building material. We're thinking back to natural stone. We, we don't have to crush it up and glue it back together. We're just taking it out of the ground, cutting it to size, and we're done. So you can see that the impact of, of the precast concrete manufacturing is at 62.3 where our cladding, one I'll remind you, was at 21.4. So quite a bit higher than we're, we are with natural stone, but I hope that by seeing the process of the manufacturing that it helps you to understand you know, why stone can come in lower. Now, it wasn't easy for us to come up with, with um, this comparison because the concrete EPD, it was an industry-wide EPD for architectural cladding panels, 
it was written to a ton for the functional unit. So we had to convert it to a meter squared. With our natural stone exterior cladding industry-wide EPD, we had to narrow the scope from A1 to A3 and exclude the rest of it, just so that we were comparing as close to apples apples as we could. And note, you know, this comparison that, that we've been able to make isn't possible with most of the embodied carbon calculator tools because of these necessary calculations. Another example of how we're showcasing our embodied carbon data that we got through, through the EPDs is this case study. This is an aquatic center. It's got 241 meters square of exterior cladding. We know natural stone is coming in at 21.4 kilograms, precast concrete at 21.3 kilograms. So we're multiplying these numbers with the 241 to get the total carbon embodied carbon impacts for this project. So with using natural stone instead of a precast concrete cladding panel, for this particular project, you're able to save about 10 metric tons of embodied carbon. So we think that's a pretty compelling story to tell. Um, when no industry-wide EPD exists, we averaged a set of individual EPDs. So I want to show you this because this is another key, you know, tricky part of making comparisons. This is Terrazzo, for example. Hey, Sarah, so, hate to jump yes. in. Just want to make sure that if you could wrap it up like in a minute so we can hear Jasmine's story. Okay, sure. Um, just showcasing here the complexities, different numbers, um, some of them quite higher. So we always have to wonder, you know, are we reporting the correct information or getting the right information from the right EPDs? So what we've learned as an industry, um, industry-wide EPDs and HPDs have done what we originally intended, which is to get us an in and to be listed in several architectural material catalogs. Also, the EPDs and HPDs have indeed helped us to increase awareness about our industry standard. Three, it's difficult to make comparisons between product categories. And the last thing, which Jasmine will be able to elaborate on a little bit more, our original decision to combine our stone types and product subcategories into one single result, it averaged result, has allowed individual manufacturers to showcase some of that um, optimization. So as I close, um, just two quick links for you. If you wanna get our industry-wide EPDs and HPDs, you can scan that top QR code that takes you to the Sustainable Minds Transparency Catalog and our Natural Stone Institute sustainability mailing list if you'd like to stay in touch and, and keep an eye on what we're promoting and, and our available resources, then you can scan that second QR code to get added to our mailing list. Well, thank Sarah, you very thank much. you very much. Um, if I hadn't lived through it, I would be very intimidated by, by this story, but yes, it's all true. And uh, you know, Sarah, more explicitly uh, put a finer point on it. Uh, Sustainable Minds uh, was the uh, solution provider throughout the whole process. We created the Part B that was missing. Uh, we delivered the LCA services, delivered the transparency reports, um, and in fact worked with Sarah just to double check her calculations in the comparison uh, that she just shared uh, to make sure those were valid and accurate, and yes, they are. So, Jasmine, we'd love to uh, hear from you and, and tell tell us what's happening at Polycore. Thanks, Terry. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, excited to talk about our natural stone EPDs uh, and especially our optimized EPDs. Um, for those who don't know me. Is it 4K? I believe so. All right. Initially, I'm a technician design, product design, uh, but doing 3D drawing was not my cup of tea. Uh, but it's probably because of the product design that I love so much life cycle analysis and com comparing products uh, each other. Um, then I did a disciplinary study and sustainable development and marketing, management, all component of, of businesses. 
and uh, finally did an MBA with profile in corporate social responsibility, uh, which is a major component of any businesses right now, right? Um, and it leads me to Polycore, uh, where uh, I establish uh, the environmental and sustainability management uh, with first certifying uh, the first site uh, under the, the standard Sarah talked about earlier, uh, NSI 373. Um, and that leads us to uh, a really good understanding of what was our carbon footprint and uh, Along the way, how can we become carbon neutral? And this is a target we, we established in 2020 uh, to go carbon neutral just before uh, COVID hit. But we are still on that target and we are committed to do it uh, by the end of 2025. So on a really short period and because simply because natural stone has a low embodied carbon and this is some things that we're gonna we're gonna see later. So for those who don't know about Polycore briefly, uh, it has been founded in 1987 in Quebec City, and now count uh, more than 50 quarries, 20 prof processing facilities. Uh, it covers also four brands. So the Polycore uh, brand, where uh, commercial and institutional residential and artscape and masonry products are all branded under. Um, we also have a Swenson retail stores that uh, are offering a vast ver diversity of stone from Polycore, uh, but with a personalized approach for homeowners. We also have the Rock of Ages, which uh, celebrates uh, things with memorials, monuments around the world. And finally, a Fetrazo, which is a stunning uh, recycled glass product uh, we have. On the map, Polycore uh, is mainly on the northeast of North America, uh, where a lot of wonderful granites are. Uh, the Midwest, also where the amazing Vienna limestone is, uh, to our Georgia marble down in the Tate, Georgia. And we also have a vast variety of uh, limestone in, uh, in France. So a lot of stone and we are still adding a uh, new one every year with new acquisition, new new stone colors. And about them, um, we have a 12 certified site under the standard. Uh, and uh, we are really proud to support and uh, promote natural stone sustainability standard uh as a way to certify that you you are getting stone that is sustainable and uh have been quarried transformed under uh, environmental practices uh and we we are the, the most certified the company with the most certified site in our portfolio and that certification help us uh, establish, like I said earlier, our carbon footprint. And uh, we, we decided to have a target, an ambitious target, to become carbon neutral by 2025. So we are going from uh, 25,000 tons of uh, CO2 emission on scope one and two in 2021, and we're gonna decrease that, that 25,000 tons by 25%. And then we're going to offset the other part of, of that. And as you see, I, ta I, I told you 50 sites, uh, quarries, 20 facility transforming the stone. And we are only emitting that, that, uh, that low embodied carbon. So we were, for a long time, we were uh, arguing that natural stone is really a sustainable product, but uh, we were not able to prove it. But when we were saying that, we were talking about durability, uh, performance, uh, does the building material contribute to reducing the energy loss or the maintenance requirements? Uh, the wellness of the people in that project uh, is the 
building material contains VOCs? Is it releasing the VOCs? And all those questions were really uh, something that we were aware of and wanted to prove it. But the low carbon, embodied carbon aspect of it uh, is one of the, the, the reasons why we decided to go and jump in that story of EPDs uh, right away when the industry decided to, to go. Uh, we were we were there and ready to uh, to participate, and uh, we did participate in the industry wide EPD and decided to do as well uh, our three uh, category of EPDs as well. So with the floor and pavers, the countertops and facade cladding and walls. But compared to the industry, what we decided to go with is uh, to subcategorize those uh, those uh, categories to uh, stone types. Uh, like I said, we extract and transform three main stone types, which is which are granite, marble, and limestone. And all of them has uh, different attributes. Uh, and I think it, it we, we, we thought it was important to show and illustrate those through the EPDs. Um, So when, because when you compare natural stone to each other, you, you know uh, that cutting granite versus cutting lime limestone is really different. And the result would for sure uh, uh, impact, be impacted by that. And we decided to go with uh, two for the same thing, the same way, two main stone for uh, countertops uh, because we, usually don't do countertops in uh, limestone. And finally, the facade, cladding and wall, uh, the tree made granite, marble, and limestone. All of them are uh, averages of all the quarries, granite quarries, all the, the facility that transform granite uh, into facade, cladding and wall. And it's the same methodology that we use for all of them. And honestly, if we were able to to have more product category roles. We probably would have done more uh, product category because it, it, we are we are persuaded that uh, EPDs are a really good tool for for architects and design. So you can find those uh, product specific EPDs from Polycore, uh, of course, on the website, but as well on the well organized. Sustainable Mine Transparency Catalog. Uh, we cover 13 CSI master format with those eight EPDs uh, from the exterior stone cladding to the stone tiling. And along the way, you have also information about uh, Polycore, uh, the carbon neutrality goal, and such thing. But today, what I wanted to, do, to talk about is our limestone EPDs on vertical application. So you see there we have a beautiful St. Pierre linear internal wall, uh, Indian limestone pavers, veneers. Uh, and we, we knew fr from the beginning that the limestone uh, facilities were super efficient. Uh, it's large scale operation, uh, the quarries, uh, in Indiana, the quarry around 2.7 million uh, cubic feet per year, large facilities, and the processing facilities also do almost the same number. So it's it's really because they are great at what they are doing. Uh, they are uh, also using a natural stone that is super easy to transform, the stone itself. And uh, so when you compare granite, like I said earlier, it's Comparing granite and limestone, it's, it's like comparing and cutting in butter. Uh, so when you cut limestone, it's really, really, really more efficient. So our result is showing that, I believe, uh, if we are lo looking at the same project that Sarah was talking about earlier, uh, that 241 square meter of natural stone is actually our natural stone or Indiana limestone. Uh, the industry why when you compare it and you 
you analyze, it's ending up at around 5,000 kilograms of CO2 emission uh, equivalent. It, it's, the comparison is uh, 25,000 miles uh, drive. And uh, when you look at our result and you do the, the same math with our numbers, uh, you ended up with, with that uh, 3,000, uh, around 3,000 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. So it's 30% less global warming potential that architects can uh, can account under their own building uh, life cycle analysis uh, if they are using polycores numbers. And it's really clear on the on the page two of the catalog. Uh, it's super defined, and the conversion is there already for for you to use. Uh, and it's available uh, on page two, like I said. Uh, still on page two, you also have a summary of how EPDs answer uh, the green building rating systems, uh, like LEED, BREEAM, and, and other green building uh, standard. Uh, you, you will find uh, the additional credits available for, for the optimized products uh, specific EPD. And uh, it is really useful for our text and designers. So you see uh, how it is comparing uh, really fastly. Then for the business itself, when you look at the LC, LCA, uh, you can identify source of improvement and innovation. So we are able to uh, put in place best, best practices and improvement uh, uh, after analysis. And last year we did the diversity of projects uh, from the installation of power factors controllers uh, to reduce the electricity consumption to the purchase of renewable energy uh, combined with electric, hybrid equipment, electric cars, and charging stations. And all of, this, all of that, we, we did that in mind to lower our uh, carbon emission and provide the lowest uh, building material possible. And along the way, there is, there is also trends that uh, we see with the use of natural stone uh, to fr from post tension stairs to massive stone construction. And those methods of innovation uh, use natural stone to really target the embodied carbon uh, of the project. And it's, it, it may be a question for you, is it costing more? And the question is not really because in, in, in the long term, uh, they are using uh, natural stone that may not be uh, as high quality as you the intended other architects and designer would, would uh, seek for. And uh, of course, the, the staircase may be a high quality product, but if you see the super thing structure in, in, in the middle, that was made out of waste block from a quarry with minimal transformation to it, and it reduced the carbon emission of that building significantly. So we are looking forward to develop EPDs as well for those kind of products to, again, uh, illustrate how low the carbon emission from uh, embodied carbon from natural stone is. And uh, I hope you enjoy the session. You'll learn more about Polycore. Uh, and I'm ending it uh, by telling you that uh, we are there to build a naturally sustainable future uh, together. So thank you. I invite you to visit our, our website and learn more about that campaign. Well, thank you so much both to both of our presenters and for all of the folks who attended and have stayed till the end. Uh, we hope you learned a lot and we hope you learned what you came to learn. And if you don't mind as you're exiting, uh, please respond to some of those uh, survey questions and also be sure if you left a question, we will definitely get the right person to follow up with you to answer it. And I want to wish everyone a great day. And thanks again to Sarah and Jasmine for all of the work that you have both and everyone in your company have invested 
uh, in the journeys that you've all been on. And have a great day.